Call the general committee meeting to order. Will everybody please rise the prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we call upon you this evening asking for your guidance in our decision making. Give us the wisdom to make our judgments based on the best interests of this community and the children we see, serve. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Long, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Foche, roll call, please. Mr. Campbell? Here. Mr. Egan is not with us. Ms. Jackson? Here. Ms. Lee Bowman? Uh, Mrs. Lemoyne is not here. Mrs. Dysart? Here. Mr. England? Here. Mr. Long? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Warner? Here. And Ms. White? Here. Thank you, Ms. Foche. Uh, we go to the Education Committee. Ms. White? Hi. Thank you. Yes, on 2.1, we have nutrition and physical activity wellness policies. And we welcome Mr. Michael Morell. See you, everyone. Hi. So I'm here to talk about the topics for the wellness policy for the new school year. So the purpose of our wellness policy is to help kids learn, grow, and to be healthy in everything that we do. In the packets, you will find the complete wellness policy that we have. And then on the back of that is also a list of all the small snacks and some regulations with that. So in an effort to promote wellness for all of our children, it is a complete team effort of all of us. Um, it starts with me making menus, principals, PE teachers, um, the school nurses, um, everyone involved, all of us as leaders. So um, the wellness committee um, is combined. So it starts here today, kind of a little bit everything, um, the policy, and then also it is um, each school will have separate meetings with their representatives and also I will meet with those representatives for the school committee meeting in January 18th we're going to decide we'll go over how to make meetings better make sure we're on the right track and also um, making sure that we provide healthy meals to all of our children um, so like I said, you do have a copy of the wellness policy and there's also on our website, on St. Bernard, uh, the SPP.org. Uh, the wellness policy follows the regulations um, of healthy um, breakfast and lunch and they also, the regulations of the USDA standards for student meals, and also it's in line with Louisiana Act number 331, as based on the 2018 legislation that was passed. So school wellness policies, the school district policies, our wellness policy, it encourages adequate time for school meal, school meals, breakfast and lunch, uses healthy meal preparation and techniques Obviously, we don't fry foods, everything's grilled, so it's a lot more healthy. Uh, promoting a positive school cafeteria environment and serving healthy food for school parties and during the, during the day, during the school day. The importance of school nutrition and promotion, it gives students the knowledge, skills, and confidence to make healthy eating choices, nutrition education, it may include teaching about healthy meals and patterns, reading nutrition facts and labels, and we also do that by posting the meals daily in all of the cafeterias so they changed, and we also post them on the website. Um, our four week cycle menu is posted. The uh, team nutrition resources and libraries can be found, so that's also through the uh, USDA, and then that's also through posters and patterns and handouts that the children get throughout the school year. 
Uh, we want the kids to have a healthy opportunity to be physical and active. So we encourage that the kids are active for 60 minutes a day. So that, that's encouraged through PE, physical education, um, after school activities, um, recess time, and school sports. So that's their physical uh, portion of that. It's also made through like, food marketing. That's why you see like in the cafeterias we have pictures of broccoli and carrots and trying to make, make sure they make healthy decisions because we do do it off of versus serve. So they do have the choice to eat vegetables and fruits and it, it is, it's given to them every day, but we also give them the opportunity to make healthy choices. And we encourage that. So the public involvement, just like I was saying, was, you know, we are all kind of pay a, pay a part of that. Um, the wellness policy is posted on the school system website, like I was saying before, and then we are also going to start in October starting surveys where parents, students, the community leaders, teachers, I can, and administration, I can get feedback what they think of the menus. We didn't make a lot of drastic this drastic changes to the new menu. Um, we're just trying to make sure it's a little bit healthier and give them some more options. Um, in the wellness committee meeting, so I'll get a lot of feedback through that. But in the surveys, it gives a chance for parents and the students themselves to give me personal, their opinion and feedback from that. So they can also, um, parents connecting with the wellness coordinator, obviously that's myself, so they can email me directly, and that's also through the website, my personal email, my email is there. Um, so that's in the, like the policy itself. So I just wanted to thank you. Um, if there's any other questions for that, and then while I'm here, I also wanted to invite everyone for National School Lunch Week. It is. It starts October 10th through the 14th. I'd like to invite everybody to come out to your um, to your school that you represent and come help and serve lunch. So, but the 10th and 11th is our fall break. So the days that we could serve lunch is going to be the 12th, 13th, and 14th, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of October. Mm -hmm. So if you could just let me know, um, sure. shoot me an email, and I can coordinate with the appropriate principals and my lunch staff, and we can. Uh, we haven't gotten to do that in a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. So I really, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be real fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Morello. Do Mark. we have any questions, Mr. Right. Ingram? Yes, uh, Ms. Morell. I've been hearing on television where this, the federal government's cutting out the lunch programs, you know, throughout the United States. But here in St. Bernard Parish, we're on a different program where they, they, we're still going to serve the free lunches through the end of the year. Yes, sir. Yeah, we do have, we are a part of the, uh, the CEP, CEP program. Right. We, we are in uh, the Community Eligibility Program. We're mm -hmm. um, doing that this year, and we have, we have it for two more years, this year and next year. And next year. We are part of the four-year program, so it is going to be this year and next year. Right. So I just want to reassure the, the parents that, you know, they don't have to come up with any few dollars, you know, for that lunch because they can go into their budget, especially the, these days. Yeah, so. and I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure. <laughs> it's, it's such it's a wonderful program, and it does it also – helps to encourage a lot of wellness and um, it's just it's a wonderful program. Right, they get it a helps balance. all the parents. Yeah, so right, much. they get a balanced meal with that. You know, so. might be the only meal they get. It could be, yes. Could be. Unfortunately, so. yes. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Long. Yes, uh, Mr. Morell. Um, well, I had the same concern as Mr. England concerning the uh, free and reduced lunch. Uh, do you uh, have a percentage of? Uh, students in our system that are all on free and reduced lunch? Well, because of that program, everybody does receive free, uh, free lunch. But, um, it's right, we're working on some numbers right now, but it's right about 50% had, you know, was eligible for free lunch. But that's, how, that's why we part of that program, but everybody does receive free lunch. Now, we have um, something called direct cert, which he gets certification. There's a greater percentage of students who are eligible for free lunch, but because our numbers are high um, with the economically disadvantaged students, then uh, with that direct cert numbers and the formula that is applied to it, we are part of that national community eligibility program, the CEP, 
so all of our students are eligible for free lunch, 100%. Okay. Um, I'm surprised that it's only 50%. If I remember correctly, it's much. It was, it's it was it's, a it's lot higher. higher. It's like no, 70 it, or well, 75. Well, at this point. You know, you used to go ahead and fill out free and reduced lunch applications years ago, and our rate was much higher. Right now, there is a direct certification process that the state has, which goes through the um, State Department and through some TANF monies and such. It's, it's for kids who are eligible for those programs. They directly certify them. That doesn't mean those are the only kids in the state of Louisiana who are eligible for free lunch by any means. That just means they're directly certified because they're eligible for certain programs that they can access. Um, if we were still handing out those applications to our students, we would have a much, much higher free lunch rate. In fact, our economically disadvantaged rate in the parish is over 80%. Yeah. Um, but because these direct cert numbers are to that point, and then we pair them with siblings and people in the household, there's a factor you apply to this, and if we're over a certain percentage, it makes it feasible to be a part of the CEP program, then we do so. And we are definitely um, in the 90-something percentile for that indicator. So that's why we're eligible for that program. Um, so all of our students then, because of that, are eligible for free breakfast and free lunch nice. at school. So it's both breakfast and lunch. So we, we're going to continue the uh, free lunch for everyone for at least the, the end of this school year? And, and next, next year. year. And Usually next year. there's a four-year cycle. Okay, it's a four-year cycle. So when you apply for the CEP program, and we had done that prior to the pandemic, we qualified. And if you remember when we first started it, we were zoning our schools, and we could get every school to qualify except our high school. And then the following year, we were able to do recalculations, and we could get the high school in as well. So prior to the pandemic, we instituted that CEP, the program. When the pandemic hit, what nationally they did was to switch over to another part of the school food service program that had to do with what used to call summer feeding. It was a different type under the program, and they made every school in the country eligible at that point. So everyone was getting free lunch. And um, now that has been, as Mr. England alluded to, cut out at the federal level. That program has died. So we fall back into the CEP program, which we had already applied for. So we have another two years on the cycle, and then we can reapply if those indicators are still in place. So we are fine at least this year and through next year, and we're constantly looking at the numbers. And any time during that four-year cycle, we can, if the numbers even are higher, we can reapply and start the four-year cycle again. But so we have, we're fine for this year and next year, so at the very least. So if we wouldn't have had the, the backup plan, then we would have lost the federal funding as of September. We would have year. lost the ability to give every child a free right. lunch yeah. and a free breakfast, correct. Right, okay. But because we had done that prior to the pandemic and we had that already in place, it, it'll be seamless for the children and for the parents. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Voce, and uh, we have Mr. Warner. How you doing, Mr. Morrell? <clears throat> uh, so, the second bullet point, it says students receive quality nutritional education that helps them develop lifelong healthy eating behaviors. Is that taught in uh, physical education by the PE coaches? So, yes, sir. So that is taught in school and then also, like I said, through um, just demonstrations that we have. And even so, like right now, I have a couple of interns from Tulane that I work with. Um, and we're working on PowerPoints and we're going to go out to elementary school, middle school, and the high school and to, to teach even a little further into detail of why it's important to live a healthy lifestyle and why is it important to eat healthy and what can they do for you. So we just 
given like the building blocks for them to build upon, you know, good choices and why is it important to make good choices. Yeah, stay away from the sugars and the carbohydrates. Yes, sir. And focus more on proteins on pro and vegetables. Proteins and vegetables, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do need some carbs, but we need to limit that. See Ms. Voce smirking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody likes meat and potatoes, but some, you know, everything's good in moderation. But that's, that's what we're trying to teach. Well, I'll make a motion that we send the, the policy to the full board with a recommendation. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Sean Warner, seconded from Ms. Dysart. All in favor? Wait, I have a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm I have sorry. a quick question. Mr. Ahead. Morrell, do we have any idea what percentage of students eat hot lunches at the schools? I know we, they have the opportunity to do so, but... Um, do you have any idea what that percentage might be? Right now, um, it's, we started off kind of slow in the beginning of this school year, but it, it's a little over 70% right now. So the high school is obviously doing an amazing job. Um, we're just pushing out like healthy choices. So right now, the high school's maintaining at least about 1,200 meals a day. Um, so last year, we were only about seven to 800, and um, we're, doing a, we're doing a lot better, especially with the high school. Good. A lot more participation. And it's doing well. But then generally, uh, elementary and middle schools are about 70 and 75 percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for our students to receive and, a hot meal during the day. And, yes, um, and, and some of that does change. Um, there's a lot of factors. Um, and I, I really watch um, like what meals are better. You know, as far as the kids, you know, the like more red beans and rice, or mm -hmm. you know, we do have an orange chicken, which is like an, an Asian-based meal. The numbers actually go up to close to ninety percent those days. That the kids really eat a lot, so I try to watch, especially what meals have a higher validity, so what, what kids actually go to eat a lot more, um, and try to. I'm going to adjust it a little bit more, maybe in January, but I just I want to get some more information and feedback from the children. That's why I go to school, especially doing the meals, and try to talk to a lot of the children, like what do they like, what tastes good, and I get a lot of feedback, especially from my managers, with their participation also. Okay, thank you. And when will the um, questionnaire go out? In October. So we're going to run October. that from uh, October through through the end of the year, and then for the committee meeting, which is January 18th. I get a lot of that feedback, okay. and then we can make some good decisions about that and kind of adjust the menu and you know, it's really just to give the kids kind of what they want, but within the guidelines of feeding them a healthy, nutritious lunch, breakfast and lunch. And I know most of us. Very much like to participate in a, in a panel discussion regarding the lunches. Yes. <laughs> and um, I think most of us um, in, um, look forward to the spend a day at the at the schools True, in absolutely. in the cafeteria. It's a fun day. October 12th, 13th, and 14th. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just let me know. And, and the kids get excited when they they see you know, somebody new. Guest. Absolutely. At, in the cafeteria. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Dyson. Do we have any more questions from the board? Okay, with that, we'll vote on the, uh, adopting the wellness policy. All in favor? Please cash your votes. <coughs> All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. White. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Uh, the next item is the personnel item. It's um, got my name on here. <coughs> Changes. Okay, um, I see on this report here. That we have a the man, the cafeteria manager passed away at yes. a cost. We saw yes. to hear that, Ms. Yes. Tammy Legend. So can we, can we just take a moment of silence from the budget, please? Thank you, and well, um, and my condolences go out to the whole family. You know, as far as that goes. Um, Good evening. You should have the personnel appointments in front of you. Mm -hmm. You can see we've been busy. Yeah. We are still looking for a counselor, an elementary school counselor. Okay. Might have gotten a lead this afternoon, so I'm kind of excited about that. And quite, a, we have a, a few people um, we're looking for still at Chalmette High. We need a geometry teacher, ELA teacher, and another SPED teacher. Okay. So. And what about custodians? Uh, how we how we handle that right now? Right now, I can tell you we're looking for two custodians. Two. We have okay. two vacancies. So if someone yes. wants a job, they can just yes. 
come yes. get a job. Yes. So the doors come and open. Apply. Right. Apply. Good. <coughs> And, and let me just piggyback on that. Um, from our support staff, our paraprofessionals, and our custodians and bus drivers, um, we are looking for substitutes that we will train, especially bus drivers, and we've talked about that at all of our meetings. Uh, we, will, we are certified we can train you to be a bus driver and get you ready to take the licensure exam for that and put you to work immediately. Mm -hmm. Substitutes in our cafeterias, our custodians, and our paras, we're always looking for substitutes, and then you can fairly quickly, once you, know, you, you prove that you can do the job and do it well, be able to offer you positions uh, within our school system with full benefits. So it's, it's really uh, some good opportunities for people within our schools, within our community to apply within our school system because the benefits that we offer in terms of health benefits and retirement um, are really very, very good. And you don't find that in most, in most places in businesses today. So if you're out there and you're looking for those opportunities, please come in please and come. see Ms. Pritchard, <laughs> and she'll be happy yes. to speak with you yes. and explain yes. to you what's out there and available for you. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Pritchard? And can't they apply also on the website, Ms. Pritchard? Yes. 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 Good. Yes. Just a statement. Um, Mr. Warren. I see that we have a cafeteria manager that resigned and another one that, that has to see. So. Yes. Mr. Morell is short. He's down two people, yeah. mm -hmm. two managers. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So we're looking. Well, we've made provisions we made, yes, for the one who unfortunately passed away because she did she have an sick. extensive illness. Yes. Um, and the so it's other one, one. Right. That we're advertising right now. It's just yeah. one. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Right. Long? Um, Ms. Voce, how do we stand up with uh, starting pay with uh, neighboring parishes such as uh, like St. Tammy? I noticed, well, I heard they had recently given their employees a 3% raise. Mm -hmm. um, is the starting pay uh, for our teachers compatible? Such. Our starting pay um, bachelor's degree is right over 48000 um, we were comparable, mm, and recently there were some raises in some surrounding parishes. Um, we are now looking, you know, we're looking to see, we're always looking to see what we can do. Um, and that will be in the next few months. We'll see if there is anything that we can do for our employees. I know that this board has been very good in the last couple of years in terms of the pay at the end of the school year. So if we've had monies that were available, we have passed them along to our employees and we're hoping to do the same types of things. Correct. But um, in order to be competitive, we're really going to have to look at salaries that we have and you know, look to our right. community and see what we can do. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Good Ms. evening. Pritchard. Good evening. Keep up the good work. Okay, go on to stew enrollment. Uh, Ms. Foche, update on a 2022-2023 stew enrollment <coughs> counts. Okay, well, what you have is, is just unofficial, um, you know, our official count is October 1 of each year. And what we try to do with head counts at the beginning of the school year is a brief comparison with what we had last year. And these are the numbers of students who have um, appeared in school at least once since the beginning of school. So at the top, you see at each school the enrollment um, last August, at the end of August, and then below that, the numbers that we have right now. So you see that the increase is about 150 students overall. Um, the glut of our students, you know, there is a, um, 
decrease in our middle school population slightly, mm -hmm. increase in the high school. If you look at it, when we do the demographics and we look at it grade level by grade level, the glut of our students right now are in that ninth, eighth, ninth, and tenth grade. Um, as it filters down, there are fewer students in the earlier years. So when we're projecting out, depending upon you know, any type of new developments in the parish, the families that may be moving in, because we always keep an eye as to what we have with the lower level and the birth rates and such and project as we go higher. So the glut right now is at the, is at the high school level. Mm -hmm. um, you can see, like I said, a little bit decrease at the middle school um, level and about the same at the elementary level. Uh, we're beginning to get more of our four-year-olds back because as you know, we were um, first school system in the state and that first group back and I think it was, gosh, 2001 maybe or before that where we went to a universal four-year-old program. So every four-year-old in the parish um, is offered our four-year-old program without any tuition at all, regardless of your economic level. And we at one point had a high of a little over 500 um, four-year-olds. As of right now, we have 434, so we're kind of climbing back up. During the pandemic, we found, just like as in the rest of the state, those numbers with the younger ones went down because people were keeping their younger students, I think, home and closer to it. So we're building that number back up. Uh, we had about, if I remember correctly, at the kindergarten level, a little over 500, like maybe 530 kids. So we're getting closer to that number now with the four-year-olds within the parish. Mr. Long. Yeah, Mr. Long. Uh, yeah, Ms. Loche, so these numbers that we're looking at, these are the official numbers that we're send, sending to the state? No, we haven't hit October 1 oh, yet. October these are the numbers from the schools of the students who have attended school at least once. You know, sometimes you have students on the rolls from a prior year. They may have left the parish, gone somewhere else, did not maybe come to school yet. And we're looking and we're, we're working through where do we have requests for records from other schools, um, making calls to see, well, you were on our rolls in May, you didn't come back in August, we have no requests for records and we're tracking down those kids individually. So the numbers you see in front of you now are from the principals of the schools for each, for the number of students who have come back um, since the beginning of the school year. And these numbers will probably increase a little um, until we get to the official October 1 count. And that October 1 count will determine how funding uh, it have a, a the, large impact the on the funding from the, right, the MFP and child count and, you know, special needs and those types of things. So the October okay. 1 count is very important and we're working very hard that if we were expecting any child to be here and we haven't seen the child yet and we have no official records request from another school, we are tracking those down. We also work very closely, as you know, with the Sheriff's Department and the DA's office <coughs> in terms of uh, truancy and in terms of, um, you know, residents and such. And um, we'll, we're going to be continuing that. So if we have, for example, students that we cannot locate, we will ask for assistance in locating those particular students to make sure that we have everyone covered. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Tyson. Ms. Fote, the number, um, I see the total number for Shelman High. Of that, mm -hmm. how many are at the ninth grade academy? A little over 600. Okay. Thank you. So 600 at the ninth grade, the re remainder is at, at the, at at the Chalmette, main campus. Just 10, right. 11th, 10th, and 12th. Correct. Okay. 
because I know, you know, the, some community members are concerned about Chelmet High School, mm -hmm. and um, but we have two schools for the num over 2,000 students. Right. And the of course, it's so they and I know they share some. They share many of the facilities also, and um, so it's a huge at, campus. It is, it, are, and we're very fortunate because having the one high school, we have so much to offer. You know, um, you know, with the Olympic size swimming pool, the gyms. We have three gyms. We have, you know, the courses, the academics that are available to our students is, is tremendous. And I, I know um, at graduation, you know, over 50 percent of our seniors earned um, college course. Uh, hours, uh -huh. which saves them time and their parents and their money. So it's wonderful, wonderful that we have the dual enrollment that has grown so greatly, and um, you know that students at both campuses can take advantage of many of of the the wonderful facilities um, that we do have. So thank you. You know, and piggybacking on that, Ms. Dysart, as you mentioned, we have two cafeterias, we have three gymnasiums football stadium, baseball field, girls and performing boys. <laughs> girls and boys, softball field, um, theater, performing arts center, Olympic size swimming pool. The campus itself is vast and it has lots of amenities. Um, people from community and junior colleges come and are amazed. We have better facilities they feel at our high school mm -hmm. than their campuses have. And the dual enrollment program in fact, for the fall semester, we have between two and 300 kids who are taking, and you can take some of those kids maybe off Definitely. of this number because they're at Nunez, taking these dual enrollment classes. And just for the tuition that we paid just to Nunez, and I'll, this fall semester for those students was over $330,000 just for the fall semester. Mm -hmm and we braid the funds that we have, um, SCA funds, the supplemental course allocations that we get, um, as well as some CD funds through um, the MFP, some other funding sources that we have, so that all of our kids can take these, both general education, which are academic dual enrollment classes, as well as the CTE dual enrollment as well, whatever they're pathway is, and it's free of charge. We pay the tuition. As a school system, we pay their books, we pay their fees. So, and we transport them from our schools, from our school back and, you know, back and forth. So as you mentioned, Ms. Dysart, it's a, it's a tremendous help to our students as well as to the families. And it's a significant investment in our students. and. Um, and in staffing as well, because even though many of these are, are dual enrollment classes, you know what a college schedule looks like. They're not going every day. So what we say, they could be taking a course three days a week, or they could be taking a course two days a week if it's a technical course, or four days a week. So they still have to, they're at our school the other days. And if it's on campus and it's duly taught, so you still have your high school staffing that you have to have, as well as paying for the staffing, you know, at whatever college or program um, that the students avail themselves of. In fact, 25% uh, of the classrooms are empty at Chalmet during certain periods of, during the day. Am I correct on that? Oh, okay, so what you're talking about is we have a four period day at the right. high school, or the four by four block, so each class right. is um, over an hour and a half per class. So it follows that college schedule. And every teacher at the high school has a planning period. So one of those four periods they're having planning, which means for the most part, with a few exceptions, their classrooms are empty. Okay. So what you, if you walk through the school in many cases, you do see a lot of empty classrooms because if you want to average it out, 25% of your staff is on planning, planning each period. Mm -hmm. um, and so while it seems like a lot of kids, 
We have a lot of classrooms, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we have a lot of space, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of offerings, right. both That's on correct. and off campus. So when you walk down the halls during class, you'll see many empty classrooms because teachers are in there doing their planning or in common areas during doing their planning together. Um, so, you know, change of class. You have a lot of kids changing class at any given time, but that's three minutes in between and they're in their, their next class. Um, and like I said, we have two cafeterias, three gymnasiums, the swimming pool, the cultural arts center with um, all of the classrooms and performing uh, areas involved in that as well. So it's a very, very large facility. Uh, thank you, Ms. Foche. Any more questions for Ms. Foche? Okay, move on to our insurance committee. Ms. Jackson. Hi, okay. Next up we have renewal of general liability, auto, and legal liability insurance. We have the dream team. Good evening, guys. Good evening, okay. In your package you have a proposal for uh, renewal of general liability, auto, and legal liability insurance. We have our friends from Clements Insurance. Mr. Richard Clements and Master Timothy Clements. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, again, as you recall, we are with law, uh, insurance pool, LAWMA, which is a pool composed of uh, school systems and school entities in the state of Louisiana. And we're recommending that we renew that policy at a premium of, on the third page, <laughs> 235062 dollars. It's a, it's a Slight increase from last year. The market, as you know, in insurance has been going up. It's about a 12% increase, but it's with all the same coverages that we had in the previous year. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, but we're recommending that we renew with the law. So there weren't any other insurers willing to give us a quote uh, again? Well, the, you tell them uh, we've got law, Mom. They go, oh, okay, okay, see you. Okay. They don't even have to. Can you explain to me what the equity balance is? Okay, uh, Lama is an insurance <laughs> pool, so the members of the pool own the equity in the pool. It's like we're the stockholders of the pool. Mm -hmm. And we've been in the pool for several years now. And at the end of the year, if the pool performs well, then the pool gains equity. And that is our portion of the equity of the pool. So of the equity of the entire pool, that's our portion, 265000 is our equity in the pool. Okay. Uh, so now if we were to leave, that would just go back and be distributed among other people in the pool. But that's a kind of our stake in the insurance pool, I guess. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Mr. Warner. I have, uh, so that equity, could, if can we use that towards our deductible? No. <laughs> it's just <laughs> what they have done uh -huh. in the past that they ha is they have taken a portion of the equity and provided in grants to the school system for safety grants. And we've used some of that money that they've given us to purchase cameras for our schools and our facilities and our buses to improve safety. This year, rather than do that, they, rather than do that, they used some of it to lower the cost of the premium. The premiums would have been even higher. Awesome. You know, due to the reinsurance, but since they had that, rather than give the safety grants, they used it to lower the premiums to the members. Uh, I just want one question for Richie. <laughs> so, under major exclusions, they got fishing clubs. Boats. We're not doing boats. Nobody wants to do boats. You start getting into federal acts and things like that. And, uh, on this type basis, it's just not sure. You have to go through yeah. That's Jones good. Act and several other steps. And of course, you know what happens then. And that's been a big thing in other districts where they have competitive competitions with fishing. You know, we have some clubs that can we limit it to like bank fishermen? They can just huh? fish off the bank. <laughs> well, we don't own any boats, so we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. Mr. Long. Uh, yeah, it uh, looks like it's a $26,000 increase, correct, for this year? Uh, yes, sir. Approximately, yes, sir. Okay. And, um, I don't think that's that's extremely bad. Uh, Loma has, we've been with them quite a while now. We have. We've been with them for almost 20 years, I think. Pretty close. Cool. Uh, yeah, and they perform for well. With, for sure. Yeah, they pro they perform well for us. Uh, yeah. They do offer us a lot of things that conventional sure insurance want uh, wouldn't like. In other words, we have a lot of latitude and input in defending our cases when people sue us and they're defending us. We have the right to make decisions on whether to settle or settlements on these cases. We wouldn't have that kind of latitude with conventional insurance. They would just settle yeah. and. Send, send your deductible, but we so after 20 that years, there's no reason to uh, to leave these guys because they've been they've been doing a good job. Yeah, for it's us. been a good relationship, and yeah. I think we benefited. Okay. Have benefited from. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Do we have a motion to send this board? I'll make a motion. Mm -hmm. to well, we don't have a lot of options here, but um, all right, everybody vote your machine. Motion passes 9 0. All right, next up is renewal of cyber liability insurance, which is pretty much the same situation. Uh, yes, now uh, it's it's yeah, <laughs> as you know, lately, uh, cyber. Liability insurance has become very important with all the incidents that have been happening with public entities and you know, private companies with hackers and people attacking their systems. So last year we purchased the cyber liability insurance to protect the school system and we're recommending that we renew it. It's a slight increase in premium, not a whole lot, but it's something that we feel is necessary. It's not through LOMA. LOMA doesn't provide this coverage, but they assisted us in getting uh, quotes for this coverage, and we're recommending the coverage through Lloyds of London at a premium of 36487 So this is a different insurer than last year, though? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Sure. Correct. And the premium, so all the coverages are the same, and the premium increases? $1,000. Um, I, I do want to mention, you mentioned about the two-step verification because okay. we will have to begin that in the near future. Right. Uh, a lot of insurance insurers won't cover this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, threat, this type of liability, unless you have certain safety measures in place. And one of the things that they are requiring or strongly recommending is two-factor verification, which you may be familiar with. It's when you log on to a system and they'll say, okay, we're gonna send you a text with a number and then input the number to verify that it's you and not somebody that has stolen your ID. Well, one of the conditions of this policy is that if you don't implement this, there will be a lesser benefit, there will be a lesser coverage and a higher deductible. So our intention in the future, if we're going to keep the insurance, it's going to be the same rates, the same coverage, but we're going to implement these additional safety measures in our system to further protect our is, system. Is there a time limit associated with that? Uh, we just have to have it in place before we make our first claim. <laughs> we make our first claim. Hopefully we won't have to make a claim. No, we're going to start moving towards it, you know, uh, as soon as possible. But. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Long. Yes. Uh, I can remember last, last year I was very hesitant about getting into this. And, uh, but uh, after seeing what's going on uh, in the news, uh, it's uh, something that's uh, very important nowadays. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it to our, to our attention last year, and I think we should continue it. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Warner. Uh, I'll make a motion that we send this to the full board with a recommendation. I'll look at fraud all day long. <laughs> it's very important that we have this. I have one question. Does um, ransomware, uh, is that covered? Is that part? Is that the extortion? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, that's that's, that's one, one of the main coverages. Yes. One of the biggest deals. Yes. Thank you. I'll second. Okay. So we have Mr. Warner, second by Ms. White. All right, everybody in favor of your machine. Motion passes nine zero. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. Okay. We're going to number six is finance committee, Mr. Lee Bowman. <coughs> All righty. We have tabulations of proposal for building management system upgrade. Mr. Dewey. Okay, uh, Mr. Dewey's here with me. Uh, as you recall, previously we came to you for permission to request proposals to upgrade our building management system. And we have the results of our uh, tabulation today. We had three vendors who have uh, submitted proposals, three very qualified vendors, all equally known in the industry. And uh, we feel that the best proposal for us is from Synergy Building Solutions. And uh, so we're gonna recommend the proposal from Synergy be adopted by the board at a price of $387,171.43. And Mr. Dewey can expand on any technical questions you <coughs> What was last year's numbers, do you know? I'm sorry, ma'am. What was last year's numbers, do you know? So we are, we do not have a current um, proposal from last year to do a complete um, refurbishment or um, replacement of our building management system. Right, this is an upgrade to an existing system that we have. We have an energy management system in place for years, mm -hmm. and it needs to be upgraded at this point. So when was the last time we had an upgrade? Oh, gosh, this was 20, I mean, we've had this thing in place, I know before you came, before. Absolutely. We, we put it, I know we, we may have even had it before the storm. So it's a, it's a, a system, and it's a good system in place, but um, it does need to be upgraded. We have some issues with it. And I think Mr. Dewey's going to explain uh, the rationale and reason why. Absolutely. Um, and, and components of it do even predate, you know, uh, Hurricane Katrina for that matter. But um, it's all been instituted as we have either renovated or rebuilt. Um, but at this point, we're reaching end of life on the current system. And it's not the type of thing that can just be easily just upgraded with software. Um, and we are also in this particular upgrade trying to convert over to what is called the BACnet system, which just means that it's an open protocol method of communication so that we can utilize any number of vendors should we need them and we are not married to one particular company to service our products or to provide other options in the future to us should we need them. So this upgrade actually allows us to be very independent and contemporary with the type of system that we have. And we know that we are going to, and even in some cases beginning to, uh, are already beginning to experience some issues with the system that we have, which is unfortunately end of life. Like for instance, one thing that we want to target right away, um, assuming that this is approved, we would like to begin with Trist Middle School because we have started to see some issues with programming there um, that are very much related to our building management system and our control system there. So this would allow us to make it extremely contemporary and identify and resolve all of those issues. So would you say, because this number that uh, you're recommending, 387,171, yes, that's like one of the lowest bids here. So of, of the three, is how long do you think this bid, I mean, will it last us another 20 years, or how long do you think that's going to be? Yes, the, the, the good thing or about going- Or is there going, any warranties on that? Absolutely. First, first off, um, all of our vendors were required to, uh, to provide us with a minimum of a two-year warranty on parts, and that has all been, been provided. And we also have free upgrades that are built into this proposal, so the software itself can be upgraded indefinitely. Um, and there would not be a need necessarily on any time frame to completely uh, revamp or reinstall or replace the hardware in this system. Of course, as things fail, you know, as they may, we would have to do that on a piecemeal basis. But I would not see the need for this um, anytime in, in the foreseeable future whatsoever to, to do this again. I mean, other than to replace things as they fail at that point. All right. 
Any questions from anybody else? No. Mr. Dewey, I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, difference between the lowest bid and the highest bid. It's 343000 Yes, sir. It's quite a bit of, mm -hmm. quite a difference. Is there an explanation? Um, th there is uh, to some degree there, yes, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to say that all three of these uh, these vendors that that submitted proposals to us are, are are vetted and excellent companies with 15 plus years of existence, much experience with um, ed the, the education realm, converting from Siemens proprietary systems. Uh, so they they check all of those boxes. And obviously, the distinguishing factor in this when these proposals was price. If if you look at the tabulation. Um, we were fortunate with uh, the Synergy proposal um, as they have, while guaranteed that price to us, um, utilized some available incentives and um, other, other ways uh, through energy management and uh, incentives based through the Public Service Commission as well as our offer through energy to uh, get their price at that level. Um, so they did some creative things there that they have guaranteed to us. and. Uh, it was a fairly simple decision when it broke down because at that point we were, as you can see by the scoring, um, very evenly matched in these proposals and could not easily discern the difference at that point. But when we got to the pricing, that was really our contributing factor to the decision. Oh, yeah. That is, that is a, a, a large difference. It's almost like they weren't bidding on the same package. <laughs> Well, and, and fortunately, it was, you know, the proposals were very detailed, um, and it, we put our, our expectations out, obviously, in the request for proposals. So the only way that those points could be even awarded at all would be if they met those proposals in writing, which, which they certainly did. Um, they are uh, included with uh, numerous uh, very solid references and experience of uh, of an educational nature with, with school systems and, and implementing and refurbishing and replacing this type of equipment in the past as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, sir, thank you. Any more comments from the board? I have a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Warren. Mr. Fernandez, um, just roughly, how much did we spend uh, last year on energy, electricity? About on electricity, approximately $3 million. About $3 million. Yes. And uh, solution, increase energy efficiency, past job, provide energy savings. Do we have like a, a ballpark on what they think uh, Synergy might be able to save us on a percentage basis? It's, well, all of them are anticipating there'll be energy savings. It's hard to estimate until they really get into working, but we have, we, all I can say is substantial. Like we expect substantial savings. Yeah, I mean, ten percent just would almost hmm. pay for a ten to fifteen percent would pay for this. Right. Pay for this. I, I, I think I think it'll pay for itself in the long run. Yes. It, it. It. I mean, the the idea is that it absolutely will pay for itself, even in the short term. Um, uh, you know, in the next several years, we'll see substantial savings uh, per building and, of course, as a whole district. So uh, this certainly will, over time, pay for itself and, and continue to pay for itself uh, beyond that point as well. Gotcha. Any more comments from the board? Is there a motion on the board? Hmm? Did somebody make a motion? No, no one made a motion yet. Okay. I'll make a motion. Uh, that we uh, approve Synergy as a vendor uh, at the cost of $387,171.43, and that is for the management system upgrade. And just a comment, it's almost half of the cost of one of the other vendors, so it, it, it is the lowest bid Correct. and um, meets all the requirements that were asked of in the RFP. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. He just wanted to second, that's all. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Jason. Mr. Fernandez. Okay, the next item is the Executive Committee, Ms. Dysart.
Thank you, Mr. Um, England. Okay, first, <laughs> we have more adoptions of, and revisions of school board policy, and these are based on um, the changes in the law, correct? Yes, this okay. should be our final okay, policy good. update of the year, um, and these are the ones that we weren't able to get to last time, yes. Okay. Would you, uh, the board care to go through them one at a time so that no. you know exactly what you're voting on? Well, or we, as, a, uh, as a whole, it it'll, it'll speed okay. things up if you in global. In global, right? Okay. We don't have much of a choice anyway. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a mandate, <laughs> Mr. Warren. It's a mandate. Okay, Miss Bridget, would you want to proceed? Thank, Thank you. Sure. It's good to see you too, Mr. Warner. <laughs> uh, Seven point one is GBDA employment of retired personnel. In accordance with revisions made in Act 549 and Act 601, the proposed policy update addresses employees who retired before June 30th, 2020, and is effective until July 1st, 2027, and this allows for continued hiring without benefit suspension. This policy has been shortened to reference adherence to the statutes. I like this one. Any questions? 7.2 is GBN dismissal of employees. In accordance with revisions made in Act 332, this proposed policy update specifies employee dismissals for administrators, teachers, and substitute teachers. It also addresses the dismissal of bus operators, previously referred to in our policy as drivers, and replaces, quote, written notice of charges with, quote, receipt of the superintendent's disciplinary action, if any. This policy has been revised to include this new language. What's that mean, Ms. Voce? Receipt of the superintendent's disciplinary action. There were a certain number of days that if I was going to um, <clears throat> to impose disciplinary action, I would inform the employee after an appropriate disciplinary conference and such and give them a certain period of time in which to bring to us any um, evidence or mitigating factors that they feel might moderate any decision that we would make. So it's a just change in the language, number of days, and then also identifying them as bus operators as opposed to bus drivers, and that's all technical edits to the language that in that law that was passed. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on this one? Okay. 7.3 is GBRIB sick leave. In accordance with revisions made in Act 648, this proposed policy update addresses allowable use of sick leave. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Long. Ms. Foche, with, uh, with sick leave or, well, any of these proposals, um, we, I know we have a contract that addresses sick leave um, so this super, uh, this changes the contract or supersedes the contract? Well, in our contract, it's stated that we must follow all Louisiana laws. So if there's a law that is passed which would supersede a provision of the contract, we would follow the law. We can give um, more extensive benefits beyond the law if we so choose, but whatever the law states, we cannot violate it. So this would be an update to the law, the sick leave law that the legislature made this summer, and we have to incorporate that into our policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, 7.4, GBRID military leave. In accordance with revisions made in Act 373, this proposed policy update provides that a teacher whose employment was interrupted by military service be placed upon return to employment as a teacher on the step of salary which he or she would have been placed if his or her employment had not been interrupted. Military service is defined in this act as service as a member of the United States Armed Forces during a war declared by the United States Congress or in a peacetime campaign or expedition for which campaign badges are authorized. This language has been added to the policy. In addition to that, there's new statutory language addressing active duty and participation in the National Guard or military reserves. Are there any questions at this time or discussion? Okay. 
7.5 is IDDFA <coughs> Special Education Advisory Council. In accordance with revisions made in Act 576, the proposed policy updates change the makeup of the Special Education Advisory Council. In addition to changing the percentages of certain members to be included, this act now mandates that a council shall be comprised of at least eight members. The annual written report of the council, which was already mandated, is now also to be posted on our school board's website and reported to the State Department of Education. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, there being okay. we'll 7.6 is IDDFC cameras in special education classrooms. In accordance with revisions made to Act 588, it is now mandatory for each school board to adopt policies relative to the installation and operation of cameras that record both video and audio in the classroom no later than December 31st of this year and submit the policies to the State Department of Education no later than January 15th of 2023. Ms. Foche, where are we on this issue as far as being, um, <clears throat> excuse me, having cameras in all special education classes? Okay, these would be special education classrooms and spaces where there is a majority of special education students. The intent of this at first was to be put in um, classrooms uh, for students potentially with significant disabilities who may not be able to speak for themselves and uh, to give parents then the right to request a camera be put into those classrooms. Um, and then there is a procedure that parents can go through to request the camera and if they wish to see any particular footage of a particular issue or day, there's a procedure to go through that they can view something and but not keep it or whatever because there are other children in, you know, in, involved in this as well. So we have the policy you know, that we've passed through our legal team as well as the um, forethought people who help us to write these policies in accordance with the law, but it is meant for self-contained special education classrooms. Like if you have a special needs kid, a student who is included in a regular class, it doesn't apply here. This would be classes that are totally self-contained with special needs kids or the vast majority are in there. So it's specialized areas. So, and it would be by parent request and then, of course, we would have to notify everyone who is coming in or leaving that classroom that that, you know, there is a, a working camera there, as well as the parents of other students within the room. I know, I know there's a state law, but you know that it seems like there's a fine line too, with you know Privacy. students' rights Privacy. and par parental rights mm -hmm. and privacy and you know all the other policies that we have to protect the students mm -hmm. well, and the as you said if there are other students in the classroom you know um, then the parent if if they request this they would only be able to view their particular child if there was an incident well the way in we, exclusion of others the way we foresee this at this point <clears throat> if <coughs> If there is a request, then we would comply with it because it is state law now. And then if a parent requests uh, that, that, that they would see that video at a certain time, then we would have to take it, and I'm assuming this is what we would do because we have to work out all the details. We would probably <clears throat> have to blur or redact other students within the room if we show it and we it, we do not give the parents a copy of this. They have the right to see it um, with one of us present, and then we move on from there. Um, so there will be safeguards in place, and we will try to protect the rights of all students and adults within, you know, within the classroom. But it is state law, and we will comply with that law mm -hmm. as it is written, and we will put in the safeguards necessary as much as we can for the protection of the rights of all students. 
Do we have any idea how much of these cameras are going to cost us? Well, the there, was, there was an $8 million appropriation by the legislature to fund this. And um, that is going to be split up among all of the schools in the state of Louisiana. So there's some initial funding for that. You can only purchase these cameras with it, and they could run. It depends on the type you buy and, you know, the life of it. There's uh, no replacement funding, as far as I know, you know, as these things would run out or we are trying to estimate the number of spaces that we may have to put these. Mm -hmm. um, if you notice, it's video and audio. Um, uh, to be honest, we're looking at the actual spaces that it pertains to, because there are some very private spaces with children, because there are children um, who need to have, I guess, physical things that they need to be helped with in private areas. So we may have to put a system where we would have audio in those areas, maybe not video. So there's a lot of little kinks in this that we have to work out. There are also situations where kids uh, may get related services, maybe speech therapy, maybe some of these other um, services and uh, we have to work through privacy issues with therapists and those types of things as well in relation to the student and the, and the adult and the type of session it is. So we're working through all that as it exists right now. You know, sometimes um, laws are passed with very good intentions, and then when you work through the details and implementation, it becomes a little bit more difficult than the original intent was. So we are working through that, but we will obviously comply with the law and be responsive to the parents who request this. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Voce. Are there any other questions on this policy, Mr. One Moore? quick question. Ms. Voce, does the law uh, designate how long you keep the videos after? Um, there is a, a reasonable amount of time. I, I forgot it. It's in here. You know, okay. you've got the actual law themselves. I don't remember offhand. I can look at okay. that. But it is not like a public records retention where you're talking years or anything like that. Oh, okay. It's just like, for example, we have video on our buses or videos in the hallways of our schools and such. We don't keep that as a public record or anything. Those things are taped over. So I think we need to keep it, it, there's a reasonable amount of time, and then it would just take over if we haven't gotten any requests within a certain period of time. Okay, thank just you. Just like we do on our buses, because we, you know, we tape over those after a period of time. Okay, thanks. Okay. Mr. Warner? I, I'm, I don't want to belabor this one, but $8 million is a, is a drop in the bucket compared <laughs> to the number of schools we have in the state just for the cameras themselves and then mm -hmm. to maintain, operate, you know, all the due diligence that's going to go into these cameras. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, and it's just for the purchase of these cameras. It, it doesn't have any ongoing maintenance or mm -hmm. software packages or software upgrades or what happens if they break and you got to replace or fix or whatever. So there are going to be ongoing costs throughout how do you, how do you tap this. into that eight million dollars? What are they sending? Well, you it, the eight million dollars was sent to the <laughs> Department of Education, which had sent out a survey asking school districts about how many do you think you would need or whatever, and they're doing an allocation by numbers of classrooms and such, and they're going to give us allocations. Yeah, this is truly based this upon is truly that information. An un unfunded mandate right, right here. This Eventually, it will be if this law yeah. remains in effect. Initially, the funding will be there, but the upkeep and replacement, um, you know, will then become a cost to the district. As Sorry, well. Lexi, didn't mean to belabor that. <laughs> Anyone else on this policy? Okay, thank you. 7.7 .7 is JBCE federal and state requirements for implementing school choice. In accordance with revisions made in Act 533, the proposed policy update allows for students to enroll in a public high school program of choice. 
in his or her school system without regard to attendance zones under certain conditions. This updated policy also defines program of choice. I do have a note here for all of you mentioning that because we only have one high school, this policy isn't currently applicable to us, but needs to be adopted in the event of school updates and changes. It's it, what this, um, I think this is a bill by Senator Hewitt, what this was intended, if you have multiple high schools within your district and there were certain programs offered at one school and not the other, say there was a CTE program and I don't know, welding or whatever, that a student wanted, but in his particular high school that he was zoned in, it didn't offer that program. Then he could then choose to go to the school that offers that program within his district. But since um, you know we have the one high school, this really isn't going to apply because all programs that we offer, um, all kids are eligible for those programs. Anyone on no, this? She, she did mention that at, at a chamber luncheon a while back about this mm -hmm. bill. Mm -hmm. Familiar with it, good with it. Okay. 7.8 is JGCE child abuse. In accordance with revisions made in Act 180, this proposed policy update reflects language that age and grade appropriate classroom instruction be provided to all students relative to child assault awareness and prevention. A new language requiring that the instruction include how students may report abuse or assault to the Department of Children and Family Services hotline and where on the school's website the number for the hotline is located. Each public school is required to post the hotline information in a prominent location on its website. And I will say that we have had and continue to have all of our schools and our district page um, this information on the website in prominent locations. Good. Okay, any questions? Good. It's good to be ahead of even with before they make the law, so <laughs> thanks. 7.9, this is a new policy, LEH, Patriotic Organizations. This new policy in accordance with Act 485, cited as the Patriotic Access of Students in Schools Act, or PASS Act. Patriotic organization means a youth group that is listed as a patriotic society in Title 36 of the United States Code. The list includes organizations such as Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Club, and Big Brothers and Big Sisters. This new policy allows patriotic organizations to use public school facilities for student participation in activities at times other than the instructional time during the school day. Principals are required to grant representatives of such organizations the opportunity to speak with and recruit students to participate during school hours for the purpose of informing them how the organization may further their educational interests and civic involvement. Okay. Any questions on this one? Okay. There being none, um, is there a motion on the floor to adopt all? Okay, there's a motion by Mr. Smith, seconded by Ms. Lee Bowman. Any further discussion or questions? Please cast your votes. Motion passes 9 0. Ms. Ms. Pritchett, thank you very much. You did an excellent job of, of providing all the information for this. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next is Superintendent's note. Ms. Um, just a you know, reminder that next Wednesday, September 21st, is Shaman High School Ring Day, um, the morning of the, you know, next Wednesday, 21st. Um, we also, uh, had a little preview, you know how we have our Teach St. Bernard alternate certification program. So I sat in with Ms. Schneider who now, you know, runs that program for a preview of what our rating will be on our performance profile and it hasn't officially come out yet, but we've got the highest rating possible on our alternate certification program. So I just wanted to tell you that before you know we are a highly effective program at this point based on all the criteria and um, you know that uh, the accreditation team from class measures which is the National Rating Service as well as the other indicators in the profile itself um, we talked a little bit about the retired teachers they have a meeting next Friday, I think it is, at Docville, one of their regular luncheons. I'm going to try to get over there 
and talk with them a little bit and still recruit if they are <laughs> interested in coming back, especially as tutors and interventionists to work with our students one-on-one um, -on -one or closely because we're always looking for that. The good thing with the federal funding that we've gotten over the past few years and that will be in effect until September of 2024, we're able to bring these people on to help our kids. And we know that we need to concentrate heavily on our third and fourth graders this year. Those kids were the ones who were most, I think, affected by the pandemic. Um, I know that we talk about that at the state level a lot as well because those were the kids who were in kindergarten and such when all this was mm -hmm. was uh, hitting. And as you saw statewide with the third grade assessments last year, those kids are now fourth graders and those kids scored lower than the third graders of prior years mm -hmm. had, had scored. Um, and this group now coming up as third graders are also in that um, I guess that span of time where those basic skills of reading were so important in kindergarten and, and first grade. Mm -hmm. And that's going to, you know, dovetail with the, the literacy program that we had talked about before in our comeback plan that we had presented, um, that with the heavy emphasis on literacy coaches and the tutoring hopefully you know that we have after school and the interventions uh, it's a very worthwhile initiative and it's something that we need to really address but it is extremely labor intensive and we are not only trying to recruit and have recruited many of our retired teachers but we're looking at college students, particularly in education, and offering them intervention opportunities or tutoring opportunities during the day or after school. And of course, our own teachers after school and tutoring as well. But um, we are always on the lookout for qualified people who are able to work with our kids in the curriculum that we have set up. So when they come in, it's not something that they have to create, create on their own. Our people have created the instructional materials that we are using. And they are just, they are there, I don't say just, they are there implementing what we have prepared. So it's, it's best if we have someone with an educational background um, or someone who has a degree or in that program to get their degree that we can train um, on our materials to help our students beef up their basic skills in the interventions that are necessary. So hopefully I can get over there for that um, luncheon that they've got next week over at Dockville. Um, on the 26th, which is a Monday, September 26th, the chamber is doing that second, um, the women's group, the mentoring program for our high school yeah. girls, females. <laughs> and so I'm going to participate in that, you know, with our students at um, Shelmet High School. And that's hopefully going to be an ongoing series. And the professional, you know, women within our parish are stepping up in a mentoring capacity for our students and it's really a, a lovely thing to see. We provide um, refreshments and uh, I think the students last time we did it were really, you know, they, they, they felt they were treated so well because right. we had brought the professional women in, they were, t they were talking with them about opportunities and things that they could do and was open to them and we had nice refreshments and they were so uh, I guess pleased to see that they, they were sort of like at a little professional reception. So we got real positive response from our kids, you know, as well as the people came in. So we're doing that for the second time on Monday on the 26th. What time do they do that? Um, oh, yeah. We do, an, uh, it seems to be like 9, 9.30 that morning, if I remember correctly, that Monday morning. Um, and if anyone wishes to participate as a mentor in that, I know that the chamber 
and the women's network there is looking for uh, people to help with that as well, you know, from the all walks of life here. So it's, it's a really, really good, good program, good initiative. Um, and, and just a, a quick little thing, uh, Annalise Kassar, Tedesco, <laughs> you know how, well, we all know well, she was the Louisiana Teacher of the Year last year and such, but she has that Art Strong program mm -hmm. that uh, she <laughs> does those interviews with uh, local and regional and sometimes national artists that come in. Well, she's doing one tomorrow morning, and this is just just to let people know how involved our kids are, but she's doing one tomorrow morning down at the um, New Orleans Museum, um, Jazz Museum, you know, the old Mint building. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's with the First Lady of the state, Donna Edwards, because Annalise is her uh, representative. Mm -hmm. Does that Yes Ma'am program? Is that what it is, Yes Ma'am? No? Teach Ma'am. Teach Ma'am. I knew it was something Ma'am, you know that she's the representative for. And so she's putting on one of those performances and tapings tomorrow. And I'm, I'm gonna go to that and, you know, sure, nice. and, and watch that as well. And um, she's real excited. Our Pro Star kids are going to be, if you wanna say catering the reception mm -hmm. and serving there. And we have some of our high school students who are going to be like the little ambassadors and guides there. So we've got a nice little contingent of kids who'll be downtown tomorrow morning at the New Orleans Jazz Museum for that experience that we have planned and put on uh, for mm. the group of people that are affiliated with that. So nice. just to let you know, a lot of the really good things that our kids are doing, our teachers are doing, and uh, opportunities that our kids have that they would not otherwise get if they were not in these programs. So. Ms. Fulcher, for that uh, ring day, go back to that, uh, that's gonna be on the football field? Yes, yeah, what, on what the football field. Yeah. Um, I think it's 9.30, I'll get back, it's either 9 or 9.30. 9.30, you'll get back but to I would re I'll get back to you, but I would recommend, as always, um, you know, we were parking, but get there in enough time and such, right. but we'll get you the details. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, for ring day. What was it, October? What? No, next week. That's next week. September 21st. Thir uh, 21st. 21st. Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Wednesday. Usually we have it in October. Uh, different times, depending. Yeah, they look at the schedule and, it, you know. Seniors, of course, would love to have it before this, the year even starts, you know. But uh, it's going to be September 21st. Yeah, they're excited about it. Yeah, they get excited. they're real excited about that. Anything okay. else from Ms. Voce? That's it. Thank you, Ms. Voce. Okay. Uh, item number nine, adjournment. Mr. Campbell. <laughs> Ms. Jackson. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> this meeting's adjourned. Thank you and good night. <laughs>